as soon as you capitulate with an environmental group, there's going to be some other place. There's going to be another last forest. For 150 years, I've had Indian Affairs telling me how to run my life. And that's where I see protesters, environmentalists disrespecting us. Let the locals manage their own damn area. This is one of British Columbia's over 200 sawmills, the beating heart of a BC forestry sector that has been under attack by activists, protesters, and even our own government. But is the sun really about to set on an industry that in many ways built this province? Do activists have a point when they demand an end to all old growth logging? Or can mills like this and the thousands of jobs they support serve as a foundation on which we build a sustainable future. The industry is going like this, down, down, down. I always ask people, what exactly are they wiping their ass with? There was the belief there was a crisis, and there's no crisis. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this is Politics Explained. Logging protesters halted commuters on two key Metro Vancouver routes, starting around 7 and lasting for hours. This video circulating online capturing what appears to be frustrated drivers getting out of their vehicles and physically dragging protesters from the road. Then the ladder collapsed. Over the past couple of years, activists have taken to the streets to demand an end to old growth logging in British Columbia, participating at times in peaceful protests, but also illegally blockading critical infrastructure, including highways, roads, bridges, and tunnels, preventing people from getting to work, and in some cases, even cancer treatments. This direct targeting of commuters has sparked an angry backlash from many BC residents, and even led to the creation of a new citizen-led initiative called ClearTheRoad.ca. I sat down with the lead organizer for Clear the Road, Tamara Meggett, to learn more about their campaign and ongoing frustration with protesters. The Save Old Growth Group started um, amping up, blocking more highways. They had planned to start blocking roads every single day and infrastructure every single day until they get their way. A bunch of teenagers having tantrums on the highway. Meanwhile, those of us that have bills to pay, cancer treatments to get to, uh, can't move anywhere. And, and in the case when they, they did the, the Pat Bay Highway, when that fellow fell off the ladder, I mean, it was awful. I was there. I watched this fellow come down. That fellow's on the spectrum. He's autistic. And this is what they do is they prey on those that don't know better or aren't able to stand up for themselves. They give them a purpose and a reason. They make them feel special and wanted. This fellow's life will be forever changed. In 2021, in an attempt to appease many of these activists, BC's NDP government appointed what they called the quote, Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel and promised to rein in logging in BC's old growth forests. Following the completion of the panel's report, on April 1, 2022, the government made an unprecedented announcement. Logging deferrals have now been implemented on nearly 1.7 million hectares of old growth. To give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about, this area is equal in size to 4,100 Stanley Parks. The government's decision to defer logging of more than 1.7 million hectares or over 2 billion trees sent shockwaves through BC's many forestry communities. As residents began wondering if the industry that many ways had built this province was now headed for a steep and inescapable decline. I met with a professional forester, Jim Gervan, to learn more about this decision and what it meant for BC's forest industry. What are these NDP old growth deferrals? So essentially what, what the government did is a couple of years ago, they had the uh, old growth strategic review and it laid out 14 recommendations on how the government should proceed with the future management of old growth. And recommendation six was a key one where they recommended that you know, a portion of the most at risk old growth in the province should be deferred, protected. You know, let's not let's not touch it. 
So what they did is they hired uh, a technical committee and they went through all the forest inventory data that in their view represented key at-risk forests, old growth forests that should be deferred. And that took out a significant volume of, of uh, timber that was scheduled to be auctioned this year and next year, immediately was taken off the market. As a result of the recommendations of the Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel, 1.7 million hectares are now ineligible to be logged. But who made this determination? Who was on the Technical Advisory Panel and were they qualified to be there? To find out, I sat down with the founder and CEO of ResourceWorks, Stuart Muir, whose group has been highly skeptical of the impartiality and fairness of the government's entire process. Well, there were concerns raised when the Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel was named and began its work in 2021 because right away a lot of people will notice, well, wait a minute, uh, four out of the five members appointed by the government are also affiliated with uh, prominent environmental movements. Where are the voices of science and academic foresters and industry, unions, communities, all of these other domains of expertise were just simply missing. The, the lead person in that was also one of the leaders of West Coast environmental law, closely associated with Make Way, which is the new name for Tides Canada, which has become almost infamous for its um, uh, unrelenting opposition to anything that creates Canadian jobs um, and, and these are the people in, in charge of BC's largest industry. So it wasn't a surprise when the findings came out and everything was you know a disaster and uh, drastic action was needed here there and there. Um, I, I don't think it was surprising. Have there been economic consequences from that decision? Well one of the key things that the government did immediately is, a, is that they managed the BC Timber Sales Program which is the auction program for small operators in the province. So wherever an old growth deferral area was coincident with a BC Timber Sales operating area, there was an immediate stop. So people started scrambling and it created a log supply shortage because people expect to see this 15 to 20 percent of the allowable cut auctioned and harvested on an ongoing basis and all of a sudden a big chunk of it which fell into these old deferred old growth areas wasn't available. What the public has to be prepared for is some very short-term pain here because the deferment is going to cause a log shortfall. It's already uh, uh, materializing all over the province and it's going to get worse before it gets better. While many in BC's forest industry had begun sounding the alarm, I wanted to see firsthand how these government deferments were already beginning to impact workers and what the consequences might be if they were made permanent. So I left from Vancouver with my film crew and began our journey to Northern BC. Our first stop was in Vanderhoof to meet our guide, business owner and local logging contractor, Brent Giesbrecht. You were saying compared to like normal years, you, you don't have as much work lined up because the, the, the BC timber sales just completely dried out from these yeah, old... So normally we have two or three sales already purchased at this time, uh, waiting in the queue for us to log over the summer and into the following season. None of those sales are available. There wasn't anything even advertised. I think there might have been one sale advertised since November um, due to this uh, old growth forest initiative that's out there. Are there hundreds of people that otherwise would be logging right now across the province or thousands of people that are currently not because there's these these cut blocks that went to auction basically? Oh, for sure. There's going to be, I read an article that said 12,000 jobs are at stake because of this. We're going to go up here a ways just to uh, try and meet the ATV. He's on his way, but we'll probably try and meet him partway. You staying here? I'm just waiting for you to close that door. <laughs> so we're here just north of Fort St. James, British Columbia, where much of the forest industry has been put on basically essentially hold from the NDP's old growth deferral. But we're heading to a cut block that's still operating. So we're gonna go check it out and uh, talk to some of the people who are in this industry every single day who make their livings, who feed their families from it, and talk to them about how the old growth deferrals have affected their communities. 
Now you grew up around here, Northern British Columbia. How important is forestry to the local economy? It's everything. Yeah, there, there isn't a lot else. This is, this is part of what we do. This is how we survive as a human race. We need timber, we need lumber, we need to feed ourselves. And in the fall of last year, when they initiated this old growth forest uh, program that came out, BCTS is the primary place I purchased my wood from, the British Columbia Timber Sales, and uh, they deferred all of their blocks. There, I think there was one sale that was sold since that uh, first was announced until present day and there's nothing on the, so on the program. How, so in a normal year, like let's say I go back a year or two years, how many might you bid on normally in like a six month period? Between three and five. And this, and this last five, six months? Zero. Not having sales available basically puts me in a position where I don't have the ability to tell my guys where we're going to be working the next six months, 12 months. Um, we'll try hard to find work, but I'm losing a, potentially 100% of my work. Forestry accounts for about one third of BC's goods exports. Wow. It's a huge amount. And in order to create uh, a dollar of exports, it's not just a, a log is put on a ship or, or a two by four is made. There's probably a hundred or so different job categories required to bring that about. We left our tour with Brent more aware than ever of the real world impacts the government's forestry policy was having on the industry's workers, businesses, and the communities they support. But surely the decision behind these deferrals that threatens the livelihoods of thousands of British Columbians and their ability to feed their families was not taken lightly. Surely it was rooted in irrefutable science and the reasonable desire to protect the very last of British Columbia's old growth forests. The rationale that was used to bring in these deferments at the first place is kind of uh, this whole idea that we're logging the last of British Columbia's old growth forests. Uh, is that true? Well, no, it's not true. Um, in the province today, we have 55 million hectares of productive forest land. Of that, about 11 million is considered old forest. When I say old forest, I mean over 250 years of age on the coast and over 140 years of age in the interior. These are the typical definition of old growth forest. We have 11 million hectares of it. And 75% of it will never ever be a candidate for logging. It's either in a park, like we're standing here today, it's, it's outside the timber harvest land base, 75% of it. I remember hearing an interview on CBC where they said they were just about to log the last old growth tree on Vancouver Island. That was on the CBC in a radio interview. Nothing could be further from the truth. The truth of the matter is there is a massive amount of old growth forest in BC. We did one measurement at ResourceWorks. If you took all the old growth forest in BC, you know, which is in parks, in protected areas, in the crown land and private land, and you turn it into a 100 meter wide strip of forest that was equally spaced like in nature, that, that strip would be, be enough to go around the equator 48 times. Wow. Yeah, it's a staggering amount. The sheer magnitude of BC's sprawling forest landscape became more and more apparent as we continued westward on our journey toward the small community on the south side of Francois Lake. But something I couldn't help but notice along the way were the trees comprising these northern forests were themselves not very large. In fact, driving through an old growth management area where logging is already not permitted, the trees we saw were rather small, skinny, and to be honest, not very impressive. A reality that was further explained to me by Ken Nielsen, the general manager of the nearby Chinook Community Forest. This is old growth. That's old growth. Old growth in the central interior doesn't get to be five foot trees. Our old growth are anywhere from six to 12 inch trees. A tree here lives to be 250 years old at the most. On the coast, it can live to be 1,500, 2,000. And they don't get nearly the size? No, no. A big tree here is this big. So this is, this is an old growth management area. This is pre-deferral, but basically the same kind of thing. Yep. You're not allowed in here to log because you're supposed to be preserving some kind of unique ecosystem. Yep. But I mean these are these are not massive large trees that I think people this is, are visualizing. That's the problem is they paint the province with one brush. Old growth on the coast is not the same as old growth in the interior. Old growth in the interior 
Our trees are this size. This is them. These could be 150, and I believe these, 150 the, is the, the cutoff. Yeah, these trees are roughly 120 years old. When you think old growth, what the public has been led to believe is old growth is big trees, and they grow everywhere in the province. But a big tree in Prince George is 10 inches in diameter. A big tree on the coast is six meters in diameter. Even though old growth forests in the interior of BC are comprised of trees that are much smaller and younger than those found on the coast, they were targeted by the government deferrals just the same. Although unlike on the coast, the consequences of this action could prove not just costly, but deadly too. They took every ecosystem and protected what they thought was the most at risk in every ecosystem. You get coastal ecosystems, they're, they're just so different than grassland ecosystems or, or those spruce forests in the very north. They're just completely different. And to just arbitrarily protect some of it is not consistent with how the biogeoclimatic system works. And so it's very likely that you could protect forests up there that will eventually burn. As it so happens, the town where we were on the south side of Francois Lake experienced a massive out of control wildfire in the summer of 2018 that threatened to engulf people's homes, property and with it, their entire community. All 800 residents were ordered to evacuate and leave everything behind. But instead of leaving, 100 residents decided to stay and attempt to fight the fire themselves. Using bulldozers and other equipment owned by residents, the brave men and women known as the Wolf Pack managed to contain the blaze, allowing only a handful of homes to be destroyed and saving the rest of their community. Yet the devastation wrought by the fire is still eerily visible today for all to see, and worries persist that recent actions by the government may make it likely to happen all over again. And the other thing that's obvious, and this is not something when I came up here, I was expecting to be part of this particular documentary, this episode, which is the, the forest fire implications. Because uh, you and others have been telling me that this is actually a threat to your community, all of this deadwood. This or... is a threat to our community. So to 2018, the Nadina fire and the Verdun fire, this is the type of stand structure that brought the fires into our community and burnt five homes. So this is just kind of like a, a tinderbox waiting It's just to... a tinderbox waiting for a lightning strike okay. or somebody to throw a cigarette out the window. And I just, it's funny because we were looking at this from a distance and you don't realize it until you, until you actually walk in here. I'm not sure what the, the cameras can see, but there are, there are so many trees lying on the ground here. Oh, it's... It looks like when you, it looks like if you were a, a giant and you wanted to start a fire, this is like how you would lay out your kindling or That's whatever, <laughs> or throw some newspaper on there and, and light it exactly, up. Exactly, right? So this is what drove the fires to become rank six fires, is this type of stand structure. And it's this type of stand structure that brought the fire to the community and burnt the houses down. What it does is it allows these fires to reach an intensity that is, is almost unheard of because of the amount of fuel available for them. If we don't do something with it, it'll probably burn. It's risking our communities, it's risking our neighborhoods, it's risking our livelihoods, it's risking our, our group of people who live out here in the rural areas. I mean, uh, the loggers get totally disgusted because they'll drive past an old growth management area that the beetle have killed 10 years ago and they haven't been allowed to go anywhere near it. And then it comes up and burns and it's next to somebody's house and it burns their house down. So yeah, there are very serious issues here. <laughs> By preventing logging in existing old growth management areas and newly deferred stands in BC's interior, which forms part of a natural fire ecosystem, residents believe these areas will continue to collect trees on the ground as they naturally age and die, creating a dangerous buildup of fuel on the forest floor and the perfect conditions for out of control wildfires that in time could once again threaten their homes, communities, and even their lives. The effect of those deferrals is it just is more timber being left on the land base that's just uh, fuel for a fire for, for later. And uh, if you're just adding more uh, forest out there that's never gonna get harvested, 
you're just priming it for a, a forest fire to come along completely uncontrolled. And if there's more and more fuel that's being left on the land base, that just means bigger and hotter fires are gonna, are gonna come through. You actually have stands that are in these old growth management areas that have been wiped out by the pine beetle, let's say, or by the pine beetle and then fire. And you're not allowed to go in and try to salvage this wood. Nope, nope, those are off limits. Okay, it's, it's the total. It's, what's it's, the it's, rationale? Like, what, what are they? What's the? It, it's an attitude from urban areas that, uh, that, that 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 these trees can all be saved and they will remain in perpetuality there, and 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 it simply doesn't happen. Let us manage it. It's our backyard. We're the ones that have to breathe the damn smoke when the stuff catches on fire and burns. As frustration builds in many forestry-dependent communities on the direction of government policy, so too do the concerns about the specific economic consequences that old growth deferrals are expected to bring. Specifically, the consequences of a reduced supply of fiber and logs to many of BC's mills. I headed west again to visit a sawmill just outside Smithers to better understand the impact the old growth deferment will have on their business and the people they employ. So we're on our way to see one of these local sawmills in northern British Columbia, the Seton Sawmill that is being threatened by these old growth deferrals. This is one of the great examples of how efficient BC's forest industry is. It uses dead trees exclusively, trees that would have otherwise been left in the forest or burned uh, to supply its mill to create secondary products. And we're going to go see how if these old growth deferrals come into effect, they could be forced to, to lay off workers and even close up shop. So what I'm hearing is you're basically squeezing the forest industry. You're going to lower the AAC of, of all these companies. And at the end of the day, the large companies are going to find a way to make it work. And it's these small companies that are going to be left struggling and are going to bear the brunt of these kinds of policies. Yeah, for sure. I've already heard it. I know, I know a lot of the loggers, uh, they're, they're, they're afraid to buy new machines or they're afraid to make any investments, trucks, whatever. They're just, they're just sitting tight. Any money they have, they're holding on to. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not going to be any investment right now. Yeah. So we find out what's happening, right? So yeah. Everybody's really, really worried. And I provide probably 20% of the volume for the mill that I sell my wood to. So how are they going to be able to create enough lumber to keep their employees working if I suddenly can't deliver that 20%? If you don't have logs, then you don't have anything else happening. So if they take the eye off the ball in what's going on in log supply, then everything else falls apart. Nobody came and asked me how it would affect me. And uh, you know, I've talked to industry uh, colleagues around the, around the valley and nobody, nobody at their offices were, were consulted either. So. No, it's not fair. It's um, and it's direct. It's going to have a direct impact in, in our our town here for sure. Do you think it was reasonable that that old growth advisory panel? I think four of the five people on it were connected or worked for the Sierra Club, and there wasn't a single representative yeah. from from industry. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't think so at all, and I don't think anybody else would in well unless you're a member of the Sierra Club. Yeah, and they were clapping their hands and jumping up and down. You know, usually when we have consensus out there, we want. Uh, let's just say three guys from industry and three guys from the environmental movement and one guy who's both ways. We didn't have that on the old growth committee. We're talking about companies that employ two, five, 10, 20 people. Mm -hmm. They're not the big ones. They're gonna pay the price. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be the first ones out without the old growth. If you just take four million cubic meters out of the equation and look at all the rest of the sawmills in the province, you'll probably lose five to 10 mills gone. It, 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 not immediately, but through attrition as the log supply tightens. Mm -hmm. Because in British Columbia, supply and demand are always in relative balance. You take 7% out, 7% of the capacity in the province is going to come out. And yes, that's going to cost jobs. The other side of the equation is if you took 4 million cubic meters of harvest out of the system, then that's government revenues that are going to be reduced as well. So that adds up to just under $300 million. That's a, a lot of money. On an annual basis? On an annual basis, on a go for our basis. $300 million, you know? That's over 5,000 teachers. Mm -hmm. According to the Council of Forest Industries, if the deferments are made permanent, as many expect, up to 20 sawmills across BC could be forced to close, in addition to a number of pulp and value-add mills as well, costing an estimated 18,000 jobs and devastating many of the forestry-dependent communities in the province, such as Williams Lake a point reinforced to me by their mayor and former MLA, Walt Cobb. 
how important is forestry to communities like this up in northern British Columbia? Well, for us, it's our number one industry. Without forestry, we wouldn't be here, I don't think. If we lost one mill, mm -hmm. uh, that's equivalent to about 300 direct jobs and 180 to 200 indirect jobs. You take 500 people mm -hmm. or 600 people off of a population of, of 12,000, it's a, it's a big hit. When you hear the likely consequences of the old growth deferment, you know, 10,000 jobs, probably at least five mills in the interior. Um, and, you know, that burn's going to be borne not by downtown Vancouver, but, but, but cities and towns like Williams Lake. Well, it's a major concern because we can't survive without them. I mean, it just won't happen. Uh, you lose that many people. Well, what happens to our hospitals? What happens to our school system? There's a, a downloading effect that's going to affect our community. And as I said, did they ever come to the Caribou to look at, at what they're doing with it? It's great to take a piece of paper and look a map and say, okay, well, we're going to cut this piece out for old growth. We're going to do this. But if they haven't been here in the bush to see what that, what that impact is going to be or where that it happens to be. Did they call you or people? No, away? no. I doubt if any of them have ever, ever been north of Hope. Unfortunately, the devastating consequences of what can happen to these communities when the forest industry, for whatever reason, packs up and leaves town is not just hypothetical. It's happened before. Maybe the most prominent example is Mackenzie, a town just north of Prince George. It was once a booming forestry center, but when the industry collapsed, it took much of the town down with it. We arrived in Mackenzie to find out exactly what happened. The impact of the collapse was immediately apparent. We're just, uh, are these all like the abandoned and closed pulp mill and sawmill and everything? Yeah. Yeah? So, the, so that's not running anymore? This isn't running anymore? No. Okay. Okay, thanks man. Yeah. Here in Mackenzie, BC, we have a very real world example of what happens when the forest industry packs up and leaves town. Over the past few years, the population of this town has been cut in half and the majority of its sawmills closed. This large can four mill just over here uh, closed. The pulp mill located just that way also closed. The local economy completely devastated. This just reinforces the fact that when bad or stupid government policies or any other factor leads to these industries or companies leaving, the results and consequences can be far reaching and difficult, if not impossible, to recover from. How important is forestry to, to Mackenzie? How important is it to the local economy? Well, it is the, the number one driver of our economy. And in the last two and a half years, we have lost 450 jobs. At one point in time, this community was 7,000 people. We are now 3,200. So we have lost um, half of our population. It also has that huge triple down effect that maybe, you know, that mill worker's wife was a nurse or a teacher. And so that really robs, it's a, a quite a big brain drain for our community. So. Yeah, we were, we were talking to uh, a local business owner here who said he lost employees because their spouse had lost a job in forestry and then they had to move somewhere else. Exactly. Our local logger, uh, loggers are laid out off work. The sawmills, of course, now all had to shut down. 10 years prior to that, in the 70s, there was three car lots in town. There's none of that. Um, you know, there, there's no uh, furniture stores. There's down to one grocery store. There's not even, you know, the grocery stores don't even want to be here because there's not enough people. There's one or two, one restaurant other than mine uh, in town right now because there's nobody here to eat. So, yeah, this town was booming and, and now it's not. But incredibly, for many protesters and activists, the old growth deferrals that have caused so much consternation throughout much of BC don't go far enough. Instead, they continue to demand an immediate end to not just some, but all old growth logging. But what would happen to the industry and rural BC more generally if the government capitulated to this demand? What exactly would the consequences be? The problem we see is that when you get groups like we've seen in the last you know, several months that were blocking the highways, whoever that group was, it's just another group in my mind, and they were calling for a ban on old, old growth logging, right? So what they were asking the government for and trying to incite the public into doing 
was to say, look, let's, we need to ban all logging of trees older than 250 years old or older than 140 years old without really understanding what the consequences of that would be. If we were to ban all old growth logging, the forest industry would be cut in half overnight. 100,000 jobs in this industry, direct jobs in this industry, half of them would be gone overnight. So the notion that you're gonna ban all old growth logging is, 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 is simply unfathomable to anybody in the province. Towns would become ghost towns, people would be out of work, government revenues would plummet even further than what's gonna happen with even the deferral over the next two years. But perhaps the groups and their organizers calling for the end to all old growth logging aren't particularly concerned with the consequences because, it turns out, many don't even live here. Yeah, well, it's a funny characteristic of a lot of Canadian um, environmental extremism that it's it's almost always someone from outside Canada. Ferry Creek is an interesting case. There was a small group uh, from Washington State of anarchists who identified uh, it as an area where they could apply uh, some of those um, rather extreme tactics to embed themselves into the woods. The Ferry Creek blockade, which prevented Teal Jones from logging in southwestern Vancouver Island, was started by a 17-year-old student, Joshua Wright, from his laptop while living in Washington State. This quickly turned into a massive illegal occupation, attracting thousands of people from around the world and leading to over 1,100 arrests. Seeing the success of the blockades, the Save Old Growth campaign began to use similar tactics. And once again, maybe not surprisingly, it was another foreign student at the helm. Uh, with the Save Old Growth protests, uh, those were started, uh, this is well known, um, by a foreign student who somehow secured a visa to study at Simon Fraser University, but then turned around and used that status granted to him to actually mount a, a, a campaign of illegal blockades. Um, with the Save the Old Growth crew, we have a 21-year-old student from Pakistan here on a student visa who has been one of the lead organizers on that, along with a fellow by the name of Ian who's also a foreign international student. So coming in here and, and messing in our resources, you know, how is it that a student here, as I've done international students, high school students, and if they were caught drinking, they were sent home. Never mind organizing blockades, illegal blockades on the highway. So I'm not quite sure where all the people that are doing the yelling and screaming are coming from and who's paying their way and where they're getting their money. Where is the money coming from? Like many of the activist campaigns targeting various Canadian resource industries, much of the funding comes from outside the country, specifically the United States, which as Canada's chief forestry competitor, particularly when it comes to softwood lumber, benefits the most from suppressing Canadian production and investment in the industry. So with Save the Old Growth, um, it's actually funded by a group called Climate Emergency Fund. Climate Emergency Fund is funded from the Gettys Oil Tycoon, the Gettys Oil Foundation. Mm -hmm. So you have U.S. oil money funding the Climate Emergency Fund and any activist group can get funding through this to fund their activism. In addition to receiving funding from the United States, many of these protest and activist groups claim their campaign to effectively destroy BC's most important industry is being fought on behalf or in support of British Columbia's First Nations, a fact we quickly discovered that could not be further from the truth. The hereditary chiefs along with the elected chiefs had all gone out together and I watched the video. They had all gone out together to the protesters and had asked them to please leave. We ask you to clean up your mess, pack up and leave. We have an inherent right to say who can come on our lands and who can come on our lands. That is being exercised by the highest authority of the Ditida people. They're just not listening. If you are not willing to listen to the nation whose territory you're invading, that's colonialism. So we're on our way to meet with the elected uh, chief of the Hawaiian First Nation here uh, outside of Banfield, British Columbia, uh, Chief Robert Dennis. He's been a huge proponent of a sustainable but vibrant forest industry. He's got his nation involved in the industry and uh, has been standing up to activists and protesters. 
Bush who have been trying to shut it down. In fact, he along with two other elected chiefs and hereditary chiefs from their community went and confronted activists at one of these illegal blockades uh, quite famously and uh, told them to leave their territory. I, that video that went very <coughs> viral uh, where you were there with the other uh, in support of the other elected chiefs and a mm -hmm. bunch of hereditary chiefs, yep. and they, you saw them all, they got masks on, and mm -hmm. some I heard had, had weapons. How, what was that? Was that kind of surreal? Well, or? for me, first of all, it was, it was really uh, a very proud moment mm -hmm. for me seeing the Dititat exercising their, their traditional government and telling these people, you're not welcome here. Mm -hmm. And they'd done it traditionally. Mm -hmm. That to me was so powerful that, that I, I was very, very happy to see that. But the, the sad part was watching these guys disrespect that. You know, they'll set up some blockade and they'll yeah. say it's mm -hmm. in respect of indigenous rights or something, even though they're going against everything that the hereditary and yeah. elected chiefs of, of the of the nations that the territory they're on are saying, what are you doing? This, yeah. We don't want you here. You know, telling us, oh, you guys don't have the ability to manage your forest lands. We're going to come in and do it for you. And this is what you should do with managing old growth forest. So that colonial practice of, mm -hmm. of telling us that you guys don't know what you're doing, we're mm -hmm. going to look after you, is still alive and strong and, and, and really strong in the environmental groups. The protesters holding all the signs, Vancouver, Victoria up here, that say, you know, that are demanding an end to all old growth mm -hmm. logging now. Yeah. What would the, would there be some serious economic consequences? Well, well to serious economic consequences and serious cultural consequences. I, I want to carve another canoe. Mm -hmm. Well, to log that canoe, I got to harvest a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. So they're telling me I can no longer, they want the province of British Columbia to halt my cultural right to, to harvest old growth tree to build a yeah. Because you don't know, it's the, like you said, almost like the, the yeah. eco-colonialism yeah. of, uh, yeah. you know, you don't know how to manage your yeah. lands that you've mm -hmm. lived in for hundreds or thousands yeah. of years. So when somebody says, do you last stand? Oh, <laughs> Not I know quite. there's other stands. <laughs> Not quite, right? Yeah. <laughs> During our tour across BC, a number of facts became abundantly clear. For one thing, there is simply no other industry that plays such a central role in the lives of so many British Columbians, that serves as the bedrock to so many communities, and aspires to be the foundation on which so many First Nations hope to build their future. And yet, it is an industry that feels increasingly under siege, relentlessly attacked by a series of determined and well-financed environmental groups while being ignored or worse by politicians living in cities on the coast. This is the industry that built this province that is, in many ways, the envy of the world. Millions of hectares already protected, big trees beloved by so many already protected as well. Is it perfect? No. But no person or process ever is, and there can always be improvement. But it is an industry, all things considered, of which every British Columbian can undoubtedly be proud. So I think, yes, the industry should be proud of it. 100,000 people work in this industry, they're good paying jobs, and they support a lot of the rural communities that really don't have other uh, employment opportunities like the forest industry. It's hard for me to see the sense in it. It doesn't make any sense that you would, would stop something that's working. Why fix what isn't broken? Environmental groups that want to see that stopped Guaranteed all of them enjoy living in a warm house with stud walls. 45 years I've been working, at, at, I could give you 45 examples where mm -hmm. they found the last forest. They can always find the next last forest because there's so much of it. Do you think that they, in your experience talking with people, have the support of the public? Or are they no. really just pissing people off? They're, they have gone way over the top and they are just pissing people off. And at a certain point, the public will not tolerate that. And I think we're very close or have passed that point. We've been logging on the coast here for 150 years. Mm -hmm. We still have 11 million hectares of old growth, 75% of which is protected and will never be touched. Where's it going to come from? Are we going to buy it from China or Russia? I don't think so. So let's do it right here. It's world class at this point. We have some of the best sawmills in the world. When I drive through our territory, even when I drive through to Port Alberni, I'm, I'm happy with what I see. You know, and that's, that's what our, our people that live in urban areas need to know, that uh, hey, our forests are being managed in, in, in a very you know, sustainable way. You gotta think that like the, the 
politicians in Victoria and Vancouver kind of don't really care what's going on up here? No, they don't. They have their heads up their ass. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.